Queer Relation Tips, an IM clinic podcast devoted to helping you, the LGBTQ plus community, create the love lives and relationships you crave. I just feel like it was a series of like conditioning behaviors and programming over time where I was like, yeah, squelch out mm -hmm. the sensitive side, squelch out anything kind of feminine about yourself. You know, I remember early on in school, first, second grade, just at recess, like I would love to play with the girls. I was really creative, came up with a lot of fun games. And like over time, I realized you get ridiculed for that. So I switched to like playing sports with the, with the boys. And, you know, it's kind of a painful thing, right? Uh, early on, I realized I wasn't really into sports, but I kind of forced myself to do. So just basically anything about fitting in was like a huge um, need back then. So anything that about me that wasn't going to fit the norm, I just sort of squelched it out, mm -hmm. compartmentalized it, put it in a box, put it yeah. way back. If you listened to our last episode with Jamie, you'll know that I wanted to focus on a series during Pride Month in terms of undoing oppression, whether that be anti-transphobia, anti-homophobia, anti-biphobia, whatever's out there keeping the queer person from falling in love with themselves. That was the angle I wanted to focus on this Pride because of Black Lives Matter and George Floyd's murder. In today's episode, we have the most warm, kind-hearted man that I know. Matt is an incredible therapist out of Chicago, so if y'all are in that area and you need a therapist, look him up. He's amazing. He has this warm, gentle soul that is found in not many men, but he has it. He has this contemplative, soft, reflective side of him. And I can almost see the way he pauses to find his truth so that he knows he's a man of integrity. We were in Orlando once for a conference together, and he uh, invited me out for a run, and I was a little late, and he left without me, and it was a good choice because I was late. And as we met up and we were running side by side with the beach over our left shoulders, I remember thinking, this man is amazing. I just feel like I'm hanging out with a brother. And in today's episode, I think you'll get a picture of what I mean. When I turn on the camera and he's sitting on the other side, he greets me with this big smile and he's sitting in this gorgeous room and he begins to share this story about how he went to seminary and was thinking about becoming a priest for the Catholic Church and all of the hurdles of homophobia that he stepped over to embrace who he is with self-love and confidence. We talk a lot about religious abuse and kind of the mechanisms that it takes within ourselves, the mechanisms we must deconstruct as a way of undoing internalized homophobia within our own identities. If you're someone who struggles to fully embrace who you are, I think you'll resonate in many ways with Matt's story. I hope you enjoy his warmth and his kind heart. Let's take a listen. I just have like three simple questions, kind of some thought prompts, but they might take us a while. Um, so I'm um, kind of relating to like homophobia. Sure. Um, so what, Hi, well, first of all, if you wouldn't mind, how do you identify? Like, what's... Oh, yeah. Cis, gay male. So, okay. yeah. Cool. As a cis, gay male, um, how would you... How did you feel like you first experienced homophobia? What were some of the yeah. first? Such a big question. Yeah. Um, so I grew up in a pretty rural area of Ohio in a very, like, conservative... Catholic Republican upbringing so you can imagine like just there wasn't a whole lot of exposure to anything other than mainstream like heteronormative and then like traditional masculine or gender norm stuff going on around me mm -hmm. so early on I think you just learn right like when you're a kid like what's right and wrong based on even silence right or outright like that's wrong or that's bad from parents um my peers and I had an older brother he's a year older than me and we were pretty close we spent a lot of time together and I just feel like it was a series of like conditioning behaviors and programming over time where I was like yes yeah, squelch out mm -hmm. the sensitive side squelch out anything kind of feminine about yourself um 
you know, I remember early on in school, first, second grade, just at recess, like I would love to play with the girls. I was really creative, came up with a lot of fun games. And like over time, I realized you get ridiculed for that. So I switched to like playing sports with the, with the boys and, you know, it's kind of a painful thing, right? Uh, early on, I realized I wasn't really into sports, but I kind of forced myself to be. So, yeah. so yeah. just basically anything about fitting in was like a huge um, need back then. So anything about me that wasn't going to fit the norm, I just sort of squelched it out. Mm-hmm. Yes. Like compartmentalized it, put it in a box, put it yeah. way back. Absolutely. So. When you say squelched it out, do you feel like it was... Um, like what did you have to squelch? Was it your personality? Kind of my language is we have to squelch our desire. Yeah. What did it? I'd like definitely you? say a desire. Um, I think I knew early on I was some, something different about myself. You know, I would, I don't think I had the words for gay or anything like that, but mm-hmm. I just knew I was a little bit more sensitive and more creative and um, just didn't have the same interests as like the other boys my age. So I'd say I squelched out like creativity freedom to kind of go along with my own desires to do things that were like fun for me or pleasurable for me or um so it it did it felt like a lot of restriction or sacrifice at an early age but I guess I just thought that was normal for sure like what a normal boy is like life like you just Mm -hmm. don't do those things it's not on the table to do that stuff so Mm -hmm. yeah yeah for sure I feel like for whatever reason, I think as I turn 30, I'm, I'm 37, I'll be 38 in a couple of months. But as I think about home ownership and my career, um, kind of approaching my 40s, I feel like, and I think watching so many queer youth like live their lives so out on like TikTok or Instagram, right? I'm like super excited for them, but it really brings up this question of like, what would life had look like, have looked like if I was able to be out at such a young age? Could you imagine? Yeah, just for reference, I just turned 40 this year. So kind of similar Mm -hmm. timeframes of growing up, but I see the same thing. These kids, younger, queer you know youth that are able to be free and out and mm-hmm. my clients are like i came out at in high school i'm like what <laughs> that's <laughs> nice good job <laughs> good for you <laughs> so it's good it's encouraging right mm-hmm. do you feel like life would have been very different for you i can only imagine i mean it would have been right like assuming i was able to just grow up and be myself mm-hmm. yeah I wonder I know it would have I mean my path was really finding myself um because I wasn't out in high school or college right that's a very developmental time of dating and just getting mm-hmm. to know your sexuality and I didn't have that I was probably regressing in a lot of ways mm-hmm. so I was dating women and trying to fit in with like my uh, the guys I lived with in college it was all about like that kind of it's pretty bad but like that douchey mindset of like <laughs> your your v card or how many women have you slept with and For just sure. drinking at parties and all that stuff it's college life right mm-hmm. I think everybody's trying to figure out their identities but it didn't prepare me very well so mm-hmm. I, t- I can see my path now was very circuitous with like different chapters it was very much like soul seeking or soul searching so Mm -hmm. um but yeah i wonder i probably would have been in a relationship a lot earlier Mm -hmm. i think and like would have worked out a lot of the stuff that i had to work out in my 30s would have been dealt with right so yeah yeah i think i don't know i would love to hear your impressions of this as a therapist but i feel like the the coming out experience not only to ourselves and our loved ones but letting people see us demonstrate our sexuality holding hands moving in with our partner affection you know but that really i for me i kind of resonate with your journey here the soul searching part but it's almost like i learned how to to not only trust myself 
but also see the beauty in like uh, very deep ways, like challenging mm. masculine norms. And I feel like what we get to do as queer people is maybe what is not happening among the straight community that allows to like toxic masculinity to stay alive. Yeah. There's a beauty in that. I think you're right. Like that resonates that there's a freedom in what we get to be because there's not a lot of, well, we didn't have many role models from growing up. We didn't have like a set example. Mm -hmm. So we have to create kind of, and there's a lot of space to create, like, what does this look like? Which I think you're right. We can default into like letting love fill those gaps versus this idea of masculinity is this way and femininity is this way and this is what a marriage is and i mean but it's also flip side that can be very challenging like because we're i know my clients it's a lot of navigating like what's a healthy relationship right Mm -hmm. for queer clients Mm -hmm. and like what's what's okay and what's not okay like Mm -hmm. do we throw it all out or do we co-opt it and like Mm -hmm. how do we create a mix of originality and like what's right for us versus you know some of the truths of monogamy or open relationships or polyamory they're all very different but there's still i think from the heteronormative monogamous standpoint i think there's some beautiful components to that that we we don't need to throw all that away right for sure Mm -hmm. yeah and i think from a religious standpoint too i work a lot with clients on spirituality sexuality and we don't need to throw it all out. I think we're still spiritual, right? Like we need to remember that we can have that. Like we don't have to lose all of it because we're a minority. Mm-hmm. So. Absolutely. As you kind of did that soul searching part, I'd be um, interested to hear what at one point felt really dirty about yourself that you actually saw as, as beautiful. That's a good question. And I think it's a vulnerable one. But I'm going to have to be honest, like the, the worst part of it was felt like the sex, right? Um, the, the, the desire to be with another man, to me, was ingrained in me that that was dirty or wrong. And uh, I think I'm in process. I still, I find that part of me now to be wonderful. But I think I'm still navigating at times the old thinking can rear its head or i'll feel a subtle sense of like something off and i have to check that right Mm -hmm. even in public like holding hands kissing in front of others things like that like it still feels like exposed right Mm -hmm. but uh it's so much better i mean it's so much more free now just having done the work i've done i think a big chunk of my journey i was I almost was like reparented in a way Mm -hmm. through some of my life experiences where I finally received those loving messages. Like you're okay as you are and that you can be gay and have a life, uh, a good life, just like anybody else. And Mm -hmm. I didn't know that until some of the different chapters of my life allowed me to, to, to really um, internalize those positive messages. So, and that's what freaked me up to be able to say, I do want to try to, navigate relationships and Chicago (laughs) helped me see there's a there's a huge community you know a lot of people are doing it in different ways so coming from Ohio to Chicago was a big opportunity Um, Mm -hmm. and that's when I started to be more out and open and happy and able to see that part of myself as beautiful and good and acceptable so yeah yeah I feel you I feel like I wrote um, a blog a couple weeks ago Mm-hmm. And I call it the six phases of coming out. And I mentioned yeah. it a couple of times because we're getting ready for pride and I think it's really important. But um, the sixth phase, I think, is probably a lifelong coming out phase because it's where we, it's the part of our journey where we reclaim the desires that have been told to us or taught to us that they're dirty. Mm-hmm. And slowly throughout our lifetime, reclaiming them as beautiful, like clean, innocent. I love that. And I think adopting the courage to let them be clean is one of the biggest parts, you yeah. know? Oh my gosh, I do. Yeah. 
Hope you're enjoying the show so far. The team and I have been so excited about some of the episodes we've been able to put together that we'll be releasing soon. One of the reasons I love these episodes so much is because they are from people just like us. People thumbing through TikTok or hopping on Grindr and Tinder and exploring the world and bumping into their own insecurities or challenges that keep them from living the love lives and relationships they crave. We would love to hear from you. If you have any questions at all, it is your story and your voice that make this show so special. Hop on over to www.iamclinic.org forward slash queer hyphen relation tips. Fill out the Google form if you want to be on the show. Thanks for listening. Now let's get back to the show. And just to be open about something too, um, like there's sex and then there's like intimacy. And I think the sex part is doable, but a lot of guys I know and myself too, sometimes it's about like compartmentalizing your emotional side, right? And then it's more of a just sex, but uh, the the work I think is the intimacy, vulnerability that we really struggle with, <laughs> especially, I mean, I do too. And I see it with my my relationship and it's something that we're working on in couples therapy is just like real connecting not just like a sense of like transactional like sexual connection right Mm -hmm. and it's hard to go deep like that for sure and a gay relationship i think and uh, probably any relationship it shouldn't just be that but i think having lacked the tools of integrating like these parts of ourselves like the toxic masculinity and homophobia have made it even harder to be able to connect to that i think right Mm-hmm. feel safe to bring that out for sure yeah for me it almost felt like being in the closet was just the shaming of all of my inherent desires right like the desire to be held by a man of the same like by a man to be protected by one to belong with one um to be feminine to be seen like definitely yeah. fighting my personality but yeah. then you take that I mean, I came out for the first time when I was 22. We didn't talk about it until I was 26. Really? So that was, and that, that was like littered with conversion therapy, right? In between those four yeah. years. Yeah. And so coming out at 26 and saying, okay, now I'm out and I, I want to be in relationship and fall in love, but I'm toting around all of these desires mm-hmm. that have been called dirty and that I have experienced as dirty for 26 years. And how do I show up in relationships and just let them feel clean? Sure. Like, Such a good point. Yeah. yeah you don't just have like a, a washer for all that. Right? Yes. Sure. <laughs> and like, of course, we're going to show up in relationships and have a lot of confusion or blocked intimacy or right. sex that feels dirty. Like, too. And that's why I think the sixth phase is such a lifelong process because it's undoing. 26 years of hearing it one way and then after some of those reparenting moments it's easier but it's still a lot of work it's a ton of work you're right i'd be curious to read up on your six stages that sounds on point though about the the last stage that you're mentioning yeah Mm -hmm. it's just maintenance i think over time that Mm -hmm. takes a while to check all of the different ways we've been i guess contaminated by society in certain regards yeah totally mm-hmm. yeah yeah wow. there's the shame piece too i think is big that you mentioned and I've, I've experienced that a lot and it's yeah there's an innate part of ourselves that is unacceptable that's hidden and that just the byproduct is naturally going to be shame right mm-hmm. and shame is one of those emotions that is so difficult to, to even face let alone like overcome right so Mm -hmm. i think just naming it can be very powerful as a start like when you get out of that closet and you just say this is who i am coming out to yourself stage i don't know if that's your first stage or not but like that sense of relief of just saying well at least now i can you know be okay with my relationship to myself (laughs) and accept that piece you know there's still shame around it it takes a long time for that to dissipate Mm -hmm. i think yeah yeah oh absolutely yeah. Yes, for sure. So. What you mentioned earlier, some of those like reparenting moments where you got to learn or hear new messages. What were some of those? Yeah. 
Well, a big one was I had a journey into the seminary, and I think that would be the one that stands out the most of, ironically, like I was studying to be a priest, and my community with the Jesuits, they're an order in the Catholic Church. They were really welcoming and open-minded about, well, one was the message was like finding God in all things. Um, and they were really encouraging to have a spiritual director and a therapist, especially because I went to my director and said, you know, I'm navigating some issues. I'd come out to myself at 30, not like 28. I entered the Jesuits at like 29. And I was still really navigating a lot of that. And I think it felt safe to be in a seminary program probably because I wasn't facing a lot of the direct challenges that come with coming out. So, but I still faced them, you know, I think God was at work and all that for me. And so the reparenting was really a sense of coming out to my community, hundred percent positive regard. Other Jesuits who were also LGBTQ were very supportive. And for the first time, I had a sense of like friendship with other LGBTQ peoples mm. in a safe context. I think I needed that context to be able to be open about myself and to really navigate like loving relationships. Um, so it really like took away a lot of the shame. Uh, it helped me see myself. It allowed me to connect to God and my sexuality in a way that I don't think I would have if I was on my own, you know, doing it. And it was never like you need to go or you can't be a part of this. It was basically like we see you and we love you. So it was really cool. That's amazing. It was huge. And then ultimately through my prayer and my discernment, I realized I entered the Jesuits probably with a sincere desire to be a priest, but I didn't know a huge part of myself. And so through my prayer, I was able to integrate my sexuality and realize living in Chicago, there was like opportunity for relationship. And I still distinctly remember praying with this, but that God in my prayer was basically like, you're free. Like, I love you as a Jesuit. I love you as a gay man. Like there's no distinction there. So as soon as I felt free, I was like, peace. <laughs> I gotta go try this. <laughs> so sure. for the first time I had strength to get out and like explore my my life. So mm -hmm. it was very scary, but also very powerful. So yeah. I was 33 at that time, 34. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Sure. Yeah. Um, Our journeys are very similar, like going to seminary and finding I didn't know that. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah, I went to seminary, different, I wasn't going for an MDiv, but I was going for my master's in counseling, but mm -hmm. it was in that very specific cocktail of an environment. We had the religion and studying religion. We had the research of psychology, but also faculty and a group of Christian friends oh, wow. that really held me in a way. I think if I would have went to any other like non-religious institution at the time, it would have been way too unsafe for me Interesting. to ask deep questions and to okay. trust the voices, these reparenting voices, if you will, of other um, adult Christians and Christian friends. And I think that gave me the ability to feel safe enough to come out. That's great. Um, yeah. Yeah, so... It's like a holding space, right? It is. <laughs> yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Definitely needed that. There were layers. <laughs> so mm -hmm. I had to really like uncover that. Mm -hmm. yeah. I do think that safety is so important for, for kid. I mean, for many people, but specifically at least today for kiddos who grew up, grow up in those religious environments, mm -hmm. the journey from religion to coming out, it feels like you're leaving one and journeying towards the other. And that's right. Yeah. yeah. And I don't think you would ever, uh, I wouldn't have ever left the island of religion, if you will, not knowing that I was going to be completely safe. And it was that seminary Christian friendship experience that created that safe bridge for me. Awesome. Yeah. So were you studying to be a, a pastor did you decide to go through with the whole seminary program or how did you, I, how did that result yeah so the seminary that i went to offered a master's in clinical mental health counseling that was perfect like state yeah. life insurance ready okay. so i was never 
uh, my dad is a minister and I never want it to be one. <laughs> Got it. <laughs> Fair enough. <laughs> yeah, so I wasn't studying to be a minister. Um, 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 I did um, enjoy some of the religious studies that sure. I think going through that piece was really helpful yeah. as a clinician because it prepared me to really work with um, spiritual abuse mm -hmm. in a very powerful way. That's awesome. Mm -hmm. Yeah, we do have similar paths because I ended up shifting from theology, philosophy studies into pastoral counseling studies as a Jesuit. And then now it's a big part of what my work is, is reconciling like faith and sexuality, um, and helping sure. people who've been traumatized by churches, things like that. And mm -hmm. so, yeah, it's crazy. It is. <laughs> <laughs> I'll preface my next question with kind of a little story, but going back i feel like there are days and moments where i'm like ah oh, i just wish i could have come out earlier maybe i would have been like an yves saint laurent or a uh who knows like a um like a famous fashion designer i could have been like i would have loved to have been a shoe designer um working with Anna Winter up at Condé Nast or something you know nice. yeah <laughs> like I have all these alternate realities that I can make up but I think like just watching my temperament and who I am and what I find important in the world like helping people not that people in fashion aren't doing that but sure I think no matter even if I would have come out earlier I like to think that I would have landed here. Yeah. Even though, you know, because I do love it so much. Um, That's great. I think there's also a part of me that now feels incredibly fortunate for the journey. And this might sound weird, but even fortunate for all the pain because it, I feel like it illuminated what we're up to as humans the yeah. trauma, the recovery, the, the self-trust, the discovery towards um, integration. Mm -hmm. And so I'm, I feel really lucky now. Um, all this to say, what do you find beneficial? Like what, how has, in other words, how has homophobia actually served mm. you? Yeah. Absolutely. That's a great question. I'm going to kind of take some of what you're saying because I think it's true. Like the journey of being a therapist, kind of that wounded healer mindset of where homophobia has wounded me and caused me great pain. It's allowed me to connect deeply with those who are suffering or who struggle, you know, to empathize. And so in turn has made me to be much better as a clinician, I think. Mm -hmm. to understand what it feels like and then also the hope that can come from doing the work like my own journey of therapy and spiritual direction and those mm -hmm. parenting moments like what can come from that you know like it's not the end when you're feeling like isolated or like you don't have a future you know there's there is one and there's a lot of hope and power that comes from breaking free of it so, for sure yeah mm -hmm. so and i love my work i couldn't imagine i was in corporate for like two three years you know nothing wrong with that it just wasn't my calling i was kind of dying and anxious and <laughs> it just wasn't for me <laughs> i tried to fit in a lot of ways and it was kind of like if you look back it could feel like a series of rejections or failures or but really it was all just kind of leading me to finding the right path i this is like career four so for sure. i love it yeah that's awesome. mm -hmm. so. I know. Joe, my partner's in corporate America, and uh, mm -hmm. I watch him interact with his coworkers sometimes or listen to the business calls, and I'm like, you guys are so mean to each other. <laughs> Be <laughs> like, nice. This is work emotional <laughs> intimacy. Don't you care about each other? <laughs> I need a therapist. Get in there on those meetings. <laughs> I should like, some group therapy. Seriously. <laughs> oh, damn it. This sounds like some wounding. <laughs> <laughs> You're lashing out. <laughs> yeah. It's hilarious. Yeah, I couldn't do it anymore. George is also in corporate. And, I mean, mm -hmm. God bless him. Mm-hmm. <laughs> <laughs>
If you listen from time to time, you'll hear me talking about this dynamic of hiding who we are to protect others and their comfort, their peace, their happiness. Essentially saying, if I hide who I am, you'll be happy with who I am. I mention this from time to time, and I make sure I slip it in when I hear it because it's such a dynamic, a pervasive dynamic that plagues the queer community. It teaches us to be small, to hide, to lose track of our desires and our passions and our preferences, but its long-term effects teach us how to be invisible in our most important relationships. In this episode, you heard Matt describing his version of that, and I think it is such a shame that queer people have to endure this kind of subconscious training, if you will, because I think Matt has just something so beautiful to offer his partner. Matt comes with such integrity and the soft, beautiful gentleness that I think is a blessing to the world. It's such a beautiful gift. And I'm mentioning this because I want to encourage each and every one of you to reflect on the ways that maybe enmeshment taught you how to hide yourself to become invisible in your most important relationships. I don't have a doubt in my mind that there is something beautiful that is still yet to be unleashed from within you, whether that be more authenticity, spontaneity, joy, brilliance. There is something within you, I would imagine, that when it shows up in your most important relationships, it will rock your world, and I'm sure those around you. So as we focus on pride and this anti-oppression, In my opinion, one of the best things we can do is actually let other people see how big, how beautiful, how badass we are. And as you move through pride and you're wearing your pride garb and going out to parades and hanging out with friends, I want you to let them see the most beautiful, brilliant, big pieces of who you are. Until next time. Queer Relationships is a podcast sponsored by I Am Clinic, a counseling practice devoted to the LGBTQ plus community with in-person and virtual counseling options available. I Am Clinic, create the love lives and relationships you crave. Find us online on Instagram at LGBTQ underscore therapy and Facebook at I Am Clinic. That's I-A-M Clinic. <laughs>